Well, welcome everyone to the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. I'm Cliff May, FDD's founder and president, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our event today, Implementing the National Defense Strategy. This event is the first for FDD's new Center on Military and Political Power. CMPP seeks to promote, on a bipartisan basis, better understanding of the strategies, policies, and capabilities necessary to effectively deter uh, enemies of the United States and its allies, and to decisively defeat those who cannot be deterred. It will provide rigorous, timely, and relevant research and analysis. CMPP will build on FDD's existing expertise, not least that is which is housed in FDD's Center on Economic and Financial Power and FDD's Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation. It will incorporate FDD's Long War Journal, which has long been a vital resource for the military and intelligence community. CMPP also features professional development and research opportunities for active duty military personnel, including FDD's National Security Fellows Program. CMPP is led by former National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, who serves as Chair of the Board of Advisors. It's also led by Senior Director Brad Bowman, who will moderate today's session. Brad served as National Security Advisor to members of the Senate Armed Services and Foreign Relations Committees, and he was for more than 15 years an active duty U.S. Army officer. During that time, he was both a Black Hawk pilot and an assistant professor at West Point, presumably not simultaneously. <laughs> CMPP's uh, Board of Advisors includes former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta, former U.S. Senator Kelly Ayotte, former Deputy Secretary of Defense Robert Work, Ambassador Eric Edelman, who is here with us today, and other leading thinkers. Let me also just say a few words about FDD CEO Mark Dubowitz, also with us today. Mark and I have worked together for more than 15 years, and it is only thanks to his imagination, his creativity, his intelligence, and his determination that we now have CMPP and our other centers, and that FDD is able to co contribute as much as it does to strengthening America's national security. I am more proud than I can say of him and of the entire FDD team. Again, thanks to you all for being here. I look forward to this conversation and many more to come. Without further delay, allow me to turn the mic and the stage over to Brad. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you very much. Thank you also to Mark for this opportunity. As Cliff mentioned, my name is Brad Bowman, Senior Director for the Center on Military and Political Power here at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. I want to welcome all of you attending here in person, as well as everyone watching online and on C-SPAN. I want to offer a special welcome and, and thank our two distinguished guests, Ambassador Eric Edelman and Admiral Gary Ruffhead. Thank you for being here, gentlemen. Their resumes are too long and distinguished to read in full, but here are some highlights that I think you should know. Ambassador Edelman served as the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from 2005 to 2009. He served as U.S. Ambassador to the Republics of Finland and Turkey in the Clinton and Bush administrations. He's also a senior advisor here at FDD and a member of our center's board of advisors. Admiral Ruffhead served as the 29th, 29th Chief of Naval Operations after holding six operational commands, is one of only two officers in the Navy's history to have commanded both the Atlantic and Pacific fleets. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy and he later served as Commandant there. Most relevant for today, Ambassador Edelman and Admiral Ruff had served as co-chairs for the National Defense Strategy Commission, and, we're at once, and we are once again grateful that you two are willing to be here to discuss their critical and timely findings of the report. Gentlemen, welcome to FDD, and thank you for helping to inaugurate CMPP's first event. I can't think of a better way to do it. Thank you. Before we jump in, allow me to quickly provide some uh, context. The 2017 National Defense Authorization Act, the annual defense <laughs> policy bill passed by Congress and signed into law, established a commission on the national defense strategy. Congress required that the commission consist of 12 members, three appointed by each of the four senior Republican and Democrat members of the Senate and House Armed Services Committees. That includes the current leadership of the House Armed Services Committee, as well as Senate Armed Services Committee ranking member Reed and the late Chairman John McCain. In other words, this commission was a serious bipartisan effort led by 12 of our nation's leading national security experts. The statute tasked the commission to review the national defense strategy and make recommendations. That is exactly what the commission did. The classified national defense strategy, as well as its unclassified summary, were completed in January of 2018. The commission subsequently released its report last November. 
So today's event is perfectly timed as we prepare for the administration's submission of the fiscal year 2020 defense budget request in the coming weeks and as Congress prepares to develop the defense authorization and appropriation bills. My vision for today's event is to review the Commission's major findings and recommendations, but also to focus on what comes next. Here are some of the questions I hope to explore today with our distinguished guests. What should we be looking for in the administration's budget request? What are the leading threats we face? What is the difference between the military capabilities we need and the military capabilities we have? What should be the def top defense priorities for Congress and the Pentagon this year? In short, looking forward, what is required to implement the national defense strategy and best protect the American people? Before we dive into the many important topics we have to discuss, a few housekeeping items. For those watching online on C-SPAN or here today, I welcome you to join in in today's conversation on Twitter at FDD underscore CMPP. Finally, I'd ask that those of you in the room here today, please silence your cell phones. I will engage in a conversation with these two gentlemen until about 1240, and then we'll open up to uh, questions from the audience for about 30 minutes. Without further delay, let's get started uh, with our conversation, gentlemen. Uh, perhaps we could start, gentlemen, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, uh, perhaps first with you, Ambassador Edelman, just summarizing the, the, the report, including its key conclusions and recommendations. Brad, I'm happy to do that. Thank you very much. Thanks to Cliff and, and Mark and to H.R. McMaster in absentia for uh, allowing us to kick off this uh, important uh, FDD program. I think both Admiral Ruffhead and I are, are honored that uh, you chose us to, to do this. Um, I'm glad to uh, be here with my co-chair, Admiral Ruffhead, and, and I can assure you that uh, we treated this uh, panel not only as a bipartisan but totally nonpartisan panel. And uh, those uh, those of you who are in the audience today, and I see a lot of old friends and colleagues, and at least no known enemies yet. Um, but uh, if you had had a television camera and watched our deliberations over the uh, year that we spent um, working on this with our uh, colleagues at DoD, I think everyone would have been proud at the fact that you would not have been able to tell who uh, was designated by the ranking or minority members. Th this was 12 American patriots uh, working very hard to wrestle with the very difficult problems that our colleagues in DOD have been wrestling with and continue to wrestle with. Um, let me start by just giving a little bit of, of background uh, before I uh, get into a summary of the, uh, some of the conclusions which Admiral Ruffhead will also uh, provide. Uh, by uh, providing a little bit of background on how the commission came to be. So in the late 1990s, the Congress uh, created a national defense panel to provide it with a second opinion on the Clinton administration's quadrennial defense review. Um, and then uh, for a period of time, Congress didn't see fit to um, seek a second opinion on um, administration strategies. But in 2010, uh, the Congress created an independent panel to um, to review the uh, Quadrennial Defense Review of that year. Uh, and I, I'm a recidivist. I've served on all three of the panels that were created in the past decade. Um, the 2010 panel uh, concluded that given the costs of uh, keeping a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine in the field and the escalating costs, given the budget cuts that seemed clear were coming, and this was before the BCA was passed, uh, and given uh, America's uh, ongoing requirements for national defense, we said we thought a train wreck was coming unless something changed the nation's course. In the 2014, the Congress appointed a national defense panel to review the QDR, and we found that the, the Budget Control Act that was passed in the interim in 2011 was a strategic mistake. <coughs> we um, we suggested that, um, that the nation needed to go back to Secretary Gates's FY12 defense budget, which was the, first, the last budget before the Budget Control Act passed, um, which was the last one done based not on arbitrary budget numbers either passed back by uh, OMB or uh, imposed by, um, by the Budget Control Act. Uh, and we quoted Secretary, then Secretary Hagel's comment that the qualitative military edge that Americans had come to regard uh, almost as a national uh, entitlement was rapidly uh, diminishing. And that was the backdrop against which uh, our commission was created uh, in the 2017 NDAA and, and which we met. And 
Um, I think uh, our conclusion is, in light of those previous reports, that the consequence of accumulating strategic risk that had been gathering over the uh, past decade was that we are now on the cusp of a national security emergency. Um, our finding in general was that the department's nation, uh, national defense strategy that Secretary Mattis rolled out in January of 2018 was putting the country on the right path by focusing on uh, near-peer competitors and the return of great power competition in the form of, of the People's Republic of China and, and Russia, but we were concerned uh, about both the lack of resources that were being applied to this in light of the uh, many years of cuts under the, under the BCA, uh, and we were concerned about a lack of definition of the operational concepts that would underpin the approach to dealing with these high-end uh, uh, near-peer competitors, and I think Admiral Ruffhead is going to address that in, in more detail. Um, we saw a number of uh, emerging uh, uh, trends in the international security environment. Uh, that frame up uh, the discussion. One I've already mentioned, which is the return of great power competition, and we see that in the uh, island building campaign in the South China Sea, some of the uh, uh, bumping activities in the East China Sea. We see it in, in Eastern Ukraine and the Baltic states, et cetera. The second is the emergence of regional challengers uh, with either proven nuclear capability or aspiring to nuclear capability. In, in the form of North Korea in Northeast Asia and Iran in, in the Middle East. Um, we uh, spent a great deal of time uh, focusing on uh, concerns about the gray zone, the emergence of uh, conflict below the threshold at which the United States would likely respond uh, with a kinetic military response, uh, but which nonetheless, bit by bit, are putting the United States in a less and less advantageous a strategic position. And one of our findings was that um, although people focus on the, uh, on the regional gray zones like South China Sea, like the Baltics, there's also the functional gray zone where you've got cyber and information uh, activities, uh, what, what I would call political warfare. And in those activities, we're not just in a long-term strategic competition with Russia and China. We're in conflict every day. And, uh, and in that conflict, uh, we are finding ourselves in a more and more disadvantageous position. That, um, that is not to say, by the way, that the answer to the gray zone is always the Department of Defense. And one of our concerns is that uh, it's not just the Department of Defense that needs adequate funding, but all the other elements of national power that are required to make us competitive in, in, that, in that gray zone. Um, another trend is the uh, continued evolution of the jihadist threat. Uh, which is intensified. We have now more jihadists in more places uh, than, than we've ever had. Uh, the spread of new technologies, another issue that I think Admiral Ruffhead's going to address, but in, you know, very quickly, in no particular order, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, quantum computing, quantum communications, hypersonics, uh, autonomy in general, all of these things, barriers to entry are dropping, uh, and the uh, technologies are becoming more easily available to adversaries. And then finally, um, a kind of self-inflicted wound of um, budget instability, uh, which has been brought about in part by the BCA, which I've mentioned, but also the inability of the Congress to pass consistent, reliable um, funding for the Department of Defense. Uh, we've had uh, just a tremendous number of um, uh, continuing resolutions, and as Secretary Mattis has testified, the continuing resolutions are as much of a threat and challenge to the Department of Defense as some of our high-end adversaries because it makes it extremely difficult for the department to plan uh, and to develop the military capabilities we are going to need uh, in the future to deal with these uh, new, more serious uh, challenges that, that we face. Uh, I think the Department of Defense uh, over the last uh, 10 years has for 38 months been under continuing resolutions, which means no new starts, no new programs, uh, et cetera. Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, we believe that um, the resourcing to uh, 
support this strategy was not adequate. And we, we based that on the conclusion, uh, on a judgment, that the um, previous strategy, the National uh, uh, strate the Defense Strategic Guidance of January 2012, which the Department of Defense has been operating under previously, inherited from the Obama administration, was a less uh, ambitious strategy than the one that was announced by Secretary Mattis. And as Secretary Mattis and, um, uh, and uh, Chairman Dunford have testified, uh, they believed at the time they came into office that in order to execute that strategy, they were going to need 3 to 5 percent uh, annual real growth in the budget to execute the strategy. Um, it stood to reason, as we looked at it, that a more ambitious strategy was going to require even more in the way of resources. Now, I will tell you that if we had to try and get an answer to the question of what should the top line be among the 12 of us, uh, we would have had uh, probably 12 different answers of what the top line should be. But we did conclude that as an illustrative matter for the Congress to consider, the 3 to 5 percent that Mattis and Dunford uh, said they needed for the previous strategy ought to be considered at least as a kind of starting point for discussion of what's needed to execute this strategy. Uh, the other resource point that I will uh, uh, make is that when the Congress in its wisdom has occasionally tried to repair the damage that's inflicted um, as part of the Budget Control Act, we have had a series of two-year uh, bipartisan budget agreements. But more often than not, the solution has been to shove a lot of money at the department in the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund, what in, in previous years we would have called uh, <coughs> supplemental appropriations for the Department of Defense. And for many of the reasons I've uh, stated about continuing resolutions, that, m that money also uh, is not uh, uh, adequate to deal with the problems that we uh, face because of the limitations, again, on new starts. That money is meant to be for ongoing military operations uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, elsewhere. Um, and it's not really a way to solve the problems that we tried to identify and highlight in the report. And with that, I will turn it over to my, Thank you, sir. my co chair. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is just reinforce Eric's point about how um, uh, focused the group was and, and, and the fact that you couldn't tell the difference between who was appointed by whom. And I think one of the reasons uh, for that, the main reason for that, was that all of us really agreed that we we're at a very, very serious inflection point. You know, Eric laid out the buildup and how the, the the warning signs or warning bells had been going off for some time, but when you look at how things have changed, and particularly the rise of peer competitors, and and even though the document <clears throat> kind of frames Russia and China uh, as the the peer competitors, there's no question uh, that China is foremost um, in in our minds as as we go forward. Um, to, to Eric's point, you know, the, the strategy that was laid out and uh, the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, really does, I think, capture um, the challenges that we face. Um, but what we found, and even though the report was, the, the national defense strategy was released early in an administration, um, we found that the underlying analytics were were weak. Um, even though it was early, you should have been able to begin to see how the analysis was supporting uh, some of the conclusions, how the analysis was looking at some of the challenges that we have and putting them into operational concepts, whether they were for the South China Sea or for the Baltics, uh, for the Middle East. Um, and also important uh, to note was that as we looked at what the challenges were and talked to different areas within the department and uh, uh, even those from outside the department, that there were at times some right-hand, left-hand issues. For example, in dealing with uh, a peer competitor, you know, we've been conditioned by almost two decades of, of war in the Middle East lethal, to be sure, but not at the level or of the type that we will experience with a peer competitor. We move logistics 
uh, to the area of operations pretty much at will. Uh, airspace is uncontested. The sea lanes are uh, open. Uh, the port facilities are good. Once you get in, in and start trying to move inland, it changes, and particularly for those people on the ground, very different um, perspective of, 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 uh, of the threats that they face. But, but it's really been a very benign environment. And so in the context of major power uh, competition and conflict, what will be the major capital losses that you're going to face? And there's no question that any adversary that watches how America goes to war knows that you go after logistics because that's how we win. We win through logistics. We win through uh, extraordinary command and control ca uh, capability. The other thing that I think uh, comes into focus, too, and, and, and even though we were, we were critical of the department's lack of analysis, uh, some came back at us and said, well, you've made some of these recommendations, particularly about budgets. Um, you didn't have a chance, you know, you didn't really have some rigorous analysis to put against it either. But the fact of the matter remains that we're operating a f conventional force that was last modernized in the 1980s. We have a nuclear triad that uh, is in need of recapitalization. Uh, associated with that is a nuclear command and control system that faces far different challenges and threats and vulnerabilities than that the systems did 20 or 30 years ago. We uh, know that we are dealing with significant readiness issues and some of the tragic accidents that the services have experienced in the last couple of years uh, are examples of that. And then we also know that technology is rushing at us and the nature of war and the types of systems that we're going to have to counter and field ourselves are going to be very different. So when you combine all of those together and you say you can do it for less than what you're operating on now, that just doesn't make sense. So that, that there is a need for growth and as Eric said, you know, if you wanted to throw a dart at an exact number, it would be hard to hit. But the fact remains that the, the percentage of growth, three to five percent, whether you want to talk about a floor of $733 billion, you know, that um, the, to us that seemed like a reasonable uh, starting point and one that is going to be required to modernize both the conventional and nuclear, to dig out of the readiness hole that we we're in, and then to bring the new technology forward in, in effective ways. Um, the, the whole idea of, of, of how uh, we come at some of the challenges, Eric mentioned the gray zone, and all too often the, the, the pull is to have the Department of Defense do it. And the phrase that comes to mind for those that are old enough, you know, let Mikey do it. Uh, that's kind of, you know, the Department of Defense will do it. Gray zones are far more complex and uh, require a far broader involvement on the part of, of government to pull the various levers that are, that are involved. Um, a couple areas that uh, I think have drawn attention uh, subsequent to the release of our report. Uh, some have asked, we made the comment in the report that the challenges that we face and the rivals that are out there, that we could lose. We could lose in some of these, these uh, conflicts and contests. Uh, the question was, did, you know, was that a shock factor? No, it wasn't. It was the assessment of the, of the commission that given the challenges that we face, if we do not properly move um, the, the, uh, the nation's defense and security in the right direction, we could lose. Um, the, and, and I honestly believe that um, that, that discussion has not been had uh, with the American people. The point that we also make in the report is that many of the operational challenges that we face are classified. And, and it's hard to have that discussion. It's hard to talk about what is required when you can't discuss it. Well, the operational challenges we face are imposed on us by adversaries, and they know what the challenges are that we're that they're imposing. So we think it's important that that get out there. This is very, very uh, applicable also to space. The challenges that we face in space, heavily classified, 
Um, and not only are we unable to talk about the capabilities that we should have, I think we've seeded a, a debate, particularly on the part of the Chinese, that we are the weaponizers of space. We have to have conversations about what is, is really going on there. Another point that I'll put out that has drawn some attention as well is the comment that we made that there is an imbalance between the, the voice of the civilian leadership in the department and the military leadership in the department. And this is not uh, uh, focused on this administration. It was not pointed at any particular individuals who are serving in the Department of Defense. This is something that has happened over time. Um, the, 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 the voice of the uniform uh, military has become stronger, and for a variety of reasons, uh, the civilian leadership has had less of a say in, in the direction of defense and national security strategy. And we can talk about that in the, in the Q&A. But I'll stop there so that we can get on with great, great. Uh, the audience. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, at risk of being a little redundant, but based in part, Admiral, on your comment that perhaps the conversation has not occurred with the American people that, that the way it should help them realize how American military superiority has deteriorated over time. Allow me, if I may, just to read really the first paragraph of, of the report's executive summary and then ask you both to comment. Here's what, here's what this bipartisan panel concluded. The security and well-being of the United States are at greater risk at any time in decades. American's military superiority, the hard power backbone of its global influence and national security, has eroded to a dangerous degree. America's ability to defend its allies, its partners, and its own vital interests is increasingly in doubt. If the nation does not act promptly to remedy these circumstances, the consequences will be grave and lasting, end quote. The commission report says we are confronting a crisis of national security, and the commission warns that the U.S., quote, might struggle to win or perhaps lose a war against China or Russia. Some Americans might be startled by that. They might be skeptical of those conclusions, maybe thinking it's a bit of hyperbole. Um, can you speak to the degree of consensus, if you wouldn't mind, regarding these and how we arrived at this point? Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, early on, uh, we received some uh, classified briefings, uh, but a lot of the material is, you know, uh, available in unclassified form uh, as well. Uh, in a RAND study, for instance, uh, about how we stack up and are likely to continue to stack up in the future against our uh, Chinese and, and Russian um, competitors. Uh, and I think all of us found that to be extremely uh, sobering. One, one of the things we decided to do was try and write the report uh, in a way that was very accessible. Uh, there's not a whole lot of Pentagon speak in this report, uh, so that you know uh, members of the lay public can read this and um, and uh, you know understand what we're talking about. And and Brad, to your point, we we sketched out a few vignettes of what might happen in uh, a contingency with China, with Russia, North Korea, uh, Iran, et cetera, uh, to give people a sense of, of what this, I think all of us felt that there is a sense in the American public uh, that we are the finest military in the world, and we are. Um, and in particular, right now, as Admiral Ruffhead was suggesting in his remarks a couple of minutes ago, we are the finest military in the world at finding, fixing, and finishing terrorists. Uh, but that will not be what we're going to be required to do if we have to face, uh, you know, China in a contingency off Taiwan or in the East uh, or South China Sea, uh, nor what we will have to do if we have to deal with a, uh, a Russian move in the Baltics uh, or somewhere else uh, along among the frontline states in Europe. Um, and those are things we have not done, nor have we developed concepts to do, nor exercised or war-gamed or trained for in a very, very long time. And it was for those reasons that we concluded that, A, we might lose, and B, we needed to make the American public aware of this. I think, you know, related to that, in, uh, in, in a peer conflict uh, with the technology that we're going to be dealing with, the uh, electromagnetic environment is going to be extraordinarily intense. And, um, you know, we do not have the ranges with which we practice in those environments. When uh, we, we go against a high-end <coughs> uh, opponent, 
uh, particularly in, a, in an air or in an undersea environment, the, the amount of expendables that will be used will far exceed anything that we have had the, the practice in dealing with recently. And this, again, is where the analytics come in. You know, where, what, are, what are your expectations for precision ammunitions, for decoys, for um, you know, uh, deployable uh, sensors in anti-submarine warfare? Um, the, the other dimension of this is because our uh, areas of conflict would be removed from the United States, at least in the kinetic phase, um, what is the lift, sea lift? airlift, um, the, the number of tankers that will be required to move uh, things, the number of tankers that are required to put in place tanker bridges for replenishing combat losses of, uh, of aircraft. All of these details, which are things that we have not had to, had to deal with over the last two decades, come into play. Um, what is the nature of your reserve component, active component mix? When you look at the logistics, for example, we've become very um, uh, dependent on the reserve component. Uh, does that work in a major conflict? And then when you also look at the heavy use of reserves that we've had on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, particularly during the peak, and you know, I speak from personal experience on this, when the economy slows down, much as it did in the financial crisis, uh, tapping into the reserve component was, was a rather easy thing to do, uh, both from their desire to participate, but also employers were often supportive of having those people go. What happens now that, that the economy is doing better can you tap into that reserve component in the way that you did in the past? Again, this gets to the analytics and the, and the need for concepts to think this through, uh, and also the importance of making investments in the things that perhaps aren't as, uh, as bright and shiny, uh, that, that are just consumed in the grind of the type of combat that would be, be required. Thank you, sir. I, I note that in the report you listed the following as some areas where our military superiority has either disappeared or eroded. Air and missile defense, anti-surface warfare, long-range ground-based fires, and electronic warfare were some examples of, of what you cited. Admiral Ruffett, I was reviewing again your testimony before the Armed Service Committee, and I noted that you uh, observed the attendance of some midshipmen in the room, right. and you pointed out, you know, this is really what it's all about. Right. And we have some active duty service members here. Can you just speak to a little bit about the consequences if Congress doesn't provide the funding necessary to fund this national defense strategy? Yeah, and, and we've seen this before in our, in our country. When, um, when you do not have the, the resources, um, and, and I think one of the things that is often lost is that it's investments in, um, in the tools that people use to do what we ask them to do. In other words, I think when you when people look at the human dimension, you know, are they being paid enough? Do they have a good quality of life? My experience has been that the best uh, retention tool that that I have seen employed over the span of my career has been giving the young men and women who we ask to do the work, the tools, the resources, the training, to uh, to hone their skills and to assure a probability of success. And so, you know, as we look to the future, it's, you know, are we preparing the force in the right way uh, so that in the event of a conflict, they come out on top? And, and I think it's just so important that we think about it in a human dimension and not just as the budget going to buy more in the area of AI or cyber. Uh, we really need to look at uh, are the tools that we're giving to the men and women that are going to go in harm's way adequate to assure success. Yeah, Brad, if I could just add in, in, in your question about our declining um, military superiority in different areas, I, none of this was something we invented or discovered. I mean, a lot of this has been testified to by the service chiefs and service secretaries over the last decade as this has been going on. I think what we were able to do is uh, pull it together uh, with a bipartisan uh, group 
uh, and try and lay out and explain so the public understands that if you take, for instance, Europe uh, as an example, um, these are not things that haven't been testified about by um, the uh, chief of staff of the Army, General Milley, who, who's about to become chairman. But I think it would be shocking to the American public to know that at the time of the Russian invasion of Crimea, there was not a single U.S. tank in Europe. Not to mention the fact that, as General Milley has testified, new advanced Russian tanks are you know, superior to the tanks we now deploy uh, because of the uh, reactive armor that they have, because they've got longer range. Uh, it would be a shock, I think, to the American public to know that the U.S. Army has systematically disinvested in long-range artillery over the past decade. And so that when you look at the net advantages that a Russian force would have in dealing with a U.S.-led NATO force, uh, it, it's pretty sobering and, and pretty striking. And I think what we've been able to do is sort of uh, pull it together, synthesize it, <laughs> rather than it's not, it's not like we discovered all this. Right. And, you know, we talk about <clears throat> the uh, need for improvements in air defense. And I think if we were to walk out on the street and find someone that, you know, would would engage on air defense, they think about, oh, air defense in the context of a North Korean missile. But air defense also means uh, army units being able to move in a combat environment in Europe, providing air defense for those ground forces as they go forward against a, an adversary uh, who, who wants to own uh, the sky. And so it, it's, it's much more complex, it's multifaceted, and we have to think through what those operational concepts are going to be and make the appropriate investments. And, 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 and for fear of saying, well, we have to invest in the same sorts of things that we've had in the past, that's not what we're saying. We have to look at what are the new technologies, how are those brought into the inventory, what are the operational concepts that uh, that they will enhance, that those new technologies will enhance, and begin to think and game and test and practice and refine and just keep thinking uh, down that path and create the infrastructure that's allow that allows us to do that. Thank you. No, I, I would concur, Ambassador, with what you said. I mean, the testimony uh, <coughs> before Congress over the last decade or more has been very clear, it's kind of a slow motion disaster. Our, our service vibes chiefs have been warning for a long, long time. I remember the 2017 readiness subcommittee testimony where the vice chief staff of the Army said, we're outgunned, we're currently outgunned. And so we've, this is a slow motion disaster we've seen, been seeing coming for some time. Is the following a fair summary of the commission's report? You I think of strategy as the coordination of ends and means, more precisely ends, ways, means. I hear you saying that the ends are right. They've established basically the right objectives. You have some concerns about the ways, i.e. the operational concepts, and in the end, the means will be determined by Congress. So we're kind of batting one out of three here, right? We need, we need a little more fidelity on the ways, and we need Congress to deliver the funding. Is that a fair summary of, of, of top-line messages there? I, that's pretty good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Shift, all right. Shifting, if I may, we got uh, before a uh, quick lightning round, if I may, before we go to the audience, a um, couple of quick things I want to cover. Uh, alliances. The, the uh, report says, U.S. alliances and partnerships are sometimes mischaracterized as arrangements that squander American resources on behalf of free-riding foreign countries. In reality, the commission says, U.S. alliances and partnerships have been deeply rooted in American self-interest. From both of your perspectives, how have U.S. alliances and international engagement and leadership benefited Americans? Well, I think first is that you, there's no question that our allies need to step up and do more. No one would debate that, and the commission report <laughs> says that. But um, the alliance contributions are not merely, you know, additional increments of military capability. That's one part. But they're also uh, very important uh, for giving us access, uh, for enabling us to be forward positioned uh, in East Asia, in Europe, in parts of the Middle East. Um, and, in, and they provide us with additional legitimacy uh, when called upon to act, uh, that we're acting with a, a group of like-minded uh, countries with whom we've operated before. So it provides a variety of, of uh, you know, force multipliers uh, that uh, remain crucial. And, and uh, the, I'm glad you mentioned it, Brad, because the emphasis on alliances is one of the uh, major leitmotifs of the report. But I, th I think also we have to think um, 
more, more broadly and more deeply about the alliance relationships. For example, it's very easy to talk about, you know, we have ships in Japan and we work closely with the Australians. But, um, you know, we also have to make it easier, particularly as we move into the new technologies, for there to be genuine cooperation between and among allies. Uh, and, and how do we uh, adjust our processes and our policies to where it is much easier, for, say, for example, for uh, the technology that's being developed in Japan and, and, and I think all of us here would agree that Japan is, is world class when it comes to robotics. Uh, robotics, autonomy, unmanned systems. You know, we need to think about ways to make it easier and more effective for allies to work um, in, in that space and where both countries or multiple countries uh, can take advantage of that collaboration in ways that is perceived as uh, being equitable. Thank you. I just note that the national defense strategy, you know, had the three primary lines of effort. One is restoring lethality focused on great, great power conflict. The second was alliances. If I would argue that if we're going to shift to the great uh, focus on the great power conflicts like we're going to need to, we're going to need allies to help us in areas like the Middle East. So uh, that uh, uh, perhaps uh, gives uh, one a view on, on some of the decisions that are being made as we speak. Nuclear modernization, very quickly. How would you respond to someone that would say that the, there was a CBO report that came out highlighting the, uh, a higher price tag for our nation to modernize our triad and the command and associated command structures? How would you respond to someone who say we can't afford to modernize our nuclear triad? Well, uh, so a couple of things. I haven't had a chance to look at that CBO study, but I have talked to some folks who have, and, and I, I think it, you've got to look whenever you uh, get a study of what the cost of our nuclear force is to look very carefully at what people are counting or not counting uh, because there's always the danger of uh, uh, double counting since some of the platforms are dual capable and are meant to convey. They're meant to you know, be primarily uh, conventional mission uh, but are capable of uh, executing the nuclear mission and extremis, but you can't, uh, you know, uh, put the whole cost of that against the nuclear mission. And there are also some issues having to do with the command and control because the backbone, you know, uh, is used for both conventional and nuclear missions. So I just, for, for, uh, the, for that purpose, I think it's important to put some markers down. But uh, overall, I mean, even if the cost is a trillion dollars over 30 years, uh, that is a small price to pay for, in my view, for one of America's uh, historic comparative strategic advantages, which has been uh, to have what President Kennedy called a nuclear force second to none. Um, and I, I, uh, to me, it's the idea that it's not affordable, uh, given the wealth that the country generates, is, uh, is laughable. I mean, it, 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 we're now spending something like 3.3% or maybe a little less of our GDP on, on defense. Uh, when in the Cold War uh, we were spending routinely eight nine percent, um, you know I think uh, in an era where we're now facing great power competition, four percent is not unreasonable, and uh, we should be able to fund both, uh, you know, conventional and nuclear modernization um, in order to be competitive. My fear, honestly, is, and I'm speaking personally now, and I'm not going to associate Admiral Ruffhead with my personal view, but my fear is that we will. If we try and do both with inadequate resources, we'll do a half-assed job on both. The, what I would say is, one, I, I think the lesson that should be taken away is, is we've allowed the triad to kind of age out all at the same time. Not a good strategy in my <laughs> mind. Uh, but we are where we are. Um, I think it's also important that we look uh, at, um, at what those investments are going to provide. And, you know, I'll go back to my, my Navy roots, but the, uh, uh, the sea-based deterrent that we're talking about, the last ship of that class that we are now talking about building will come off of a strategic patrol probably in late 2080 or 2090. And when you think about stretching the investment out uh, over that length of time, in my view, that's a pretty darn good investment when you think about the duration that that capability is going to uh, serve the nation. Thanks. February 2nd is the deadline for Moscow to come back into full and verifiable compliance with the 1987 Intermediate Range <coughs> Nuclear Forces Treaty. 
It appears, of course, <laughs> that the Russians will not do so, and the U.S. will officially declare its intention to leave the INF Treaty next week. What is your assessment of the current state of play with respect to the INF Treaty? And once the U.S. leaves the treaty, presumably, what actions do you believe the U.S. must take in order to ensure Moscow does not continue to enjoy a military advantage as a result of its violation of the INF Treaty? Well, uh, Brad, I have to say that, you know, the INF question was not one we really wrestled with in the report. I mean, again, my personal view is uh, that it's a good thing that the Congress had the foresight to put some money aside to do some R&D on, um, uh, on a uh, capability that would allow us to uh, field something in the 500 to 5,500 kilometer range that is currently banned under the treaty. Um, you know, obviously, I think we ought to try and get the Russians to come back into compliance. Uh, but if not, then we have to be prepared to field capabilities. Um, and I think we have, you know, several actually that are candidates uh, in pretty in pretty short order, so that they don't have the kind of advantage that we found ourselves dealing with in the late 1970s with the deployment of the SS-20s. I mean, it does help to have lived long enough to have seen a lot of that. Yeah. No, and I, <clears throat> and I think that the nuclear posture review lays out, as we stated in the report, uh, an appropriate option to, to deal with the circumstances where we find ourselves. Thank you. Last question before we go to the audience. I only got to a portion. There's so much to talk about. But um, interested, what is your assessment of the administration's withdrawal of our troops from Syria? Obviously outside the purview of the report, but I, um, I, I can't resist to ask. My, uh, well, my personal, review, um, my personal view is that um, the uh, offhand manner uh, in which it was made and the lack of consultations with allies is, uh, uh, created an enormous uh, disequilibrium uh, in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, and I, you know, I think uh, Secretary Pompeo, um, National Security Advisor Bolton, uh, Chairman Dunford have been uh, working very hard to try and uh, deal with that and try and bring it all back into some kind of uh, equilibrium, and I applaud them for their efforts and hope they're successful. And I, I would just say that, again, um, the importance of looking at things strategically, um, you know, the withdrawal from Syria, the potential departure from Afghanistan, the impact that that will have on NATO while there's also noise around NATO, what does the big flick tell you? And so I think that um, it can't be looked at in isolation. And, and again, this is where um, we have to step back and look at how do we want to deal with particularly the Middle East, even though the strategy, the, the, the national security strategy, defense strategy, talked about wanting to pull out uh, we've all been around long enough, and I leave it to the regional expert here. It has a way of pulling you back. Yes, and so how do we want to approach it in its totality? Great. Thank you, gentlemen. We can now uh, entertain questions from the audience. Um, if you could wait for the microphone, uh, stand up if you wouldn't mind. Uh, give us your name and your affiliation. Sir. Hi. I'm Gordon Lubold with The Wall Street Journal. Um, the NDS um, uh, is seen as a very credible document kind of formalize this, uh, you know, narrative that a lot of people already felt. But I'm wondering to what degree either you gentlemen are concerned that there's still elements of the administration who believe that Iran is a huge threat, and I'm wondering to what extent you think that that's muddying the, the message or, or, la or uh, creating a lack of clarity when it comes to executing now the, uh, the NDS. I'm Gordon, I'm sorry, did you say that it was or wasn't a, a real threat? Uh, there are elements of the administration who are still focused on Iran. And are I so focused. Still focused, yeah. Still focused. Yes. Um, I think Iran is a threat to, to uh, U.S. interests in the region. Um, uh, the, uh, I think if you only focus on the nuclear piece, you can argue yourself into saying, well, uh, they're abiding, they're still inside and abiding by the JCPOA, and therefore, what's the problem? But uh, Iranian activity is n not just the, in the nuclear realm, it's also uh, the conventional side, which has been a an enormous uh, problem for our friends and allies in the region and for us. I mean, before 9-11, uh, it was Iranian-sponsored proxies who had killed more Americans than any other terrorist group in the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think uh, it's a problem that we have to manage. I think one of our concerns, honestly, was that 
the strategy suggests that uh, in order to deal with these um, near peer competitors that we are prepared to take more risk in the region. I think we had a little bit of difficulty ascertaining from the department of uh, spokespeople who we talked to where they thought that risk was coming, whether it was in the effort to contain Iran or whether it was coming in the counter ISIL campaign or whether it was in Afghanistan. There was a, a real lack of clarity about that and it was one of the reasons that as Admiral Ruff had said, our concern was that you know, you're always one mass casualty attack away from being drawn back into the region in a, in a bigger way than you want and therefore these uh, other steps of withdrawal or restraint in the region uh, need to be considered very carefully lest you put yourself in a position of having to go back in in a much less advantageous way. And, then, and I would just add that <clears throat> to Derek's point, if you want to focus just on the nuclear, you can take yourself down one path, but I think that uh, the broader view of the region that the Sunni-Shia divide uh, and conflict is going to go on and will continue to shape the region and affect uh, friends and allies that we have there. Thank you. And I just, in addition to the regional threat that Iran poses, I would just add that as the, uh, the annual worldwide threat assessment by the BNI has repeatedly pointed out through the years, and the, and the missile defense review that just came out is that Iran continues to make uh, gains on its ballistic missile program using its space launch vehicle as a means to develop potentially ICBM capabilities that could eventually threaten our homeland. And uh, the Missile Defense Review mentions the possibility of a, a third ground-based uh, missile defense site here in the U.S., but kind of punts on that decision. And these things take time. So I feel like we've been playing catch-up on North Korea, and I worry that we're about to make the same mistake on Iran. Next question. Hi, Brad. Uh, uh, thank you for a great report, gentlemen. Uh, and it is a, a – the commission is something that we pay a lot of attention to over across the river at the War College. Um, there's an elephant in the room, and it's called – the national debt. Right. Um, we're running two trillion dollar a year deficits, and you're recommending three to five percent real growth in defense, uh, which is at a very relatively high level right now. Even if it doesn't match the percentages of um, GDP that we had during the Cold War, um, should the next president stand up on inauguration day and say, "Watch my lips. No, no more tax cuts." Uh, or um, are, are there other ways that you've foreseen in, in the discussions uh, perhaps that didn't get into print in the commission at, at how we square the circle? Well, we do take on some of this. And, I mean, the, the long-term budget forecasts of CBO, I mean, I'll make very clear that the, the long-term national debt is a huge issue, as you suggest. But uh, I think 70 to 80 percent of it, according to the CBO, is driven by three three programs, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. So reform of entitlements is obviously something that has to be done. Uh, the problem that we have, we find ourselves in now with the Budget Control Act and the caps and the sequester, is that the law <laughs> mandates that 50 percent of the cuts under the uh, BCA should be borne by the Department of Defense, despite the fact that it's only 15 percent of the federal budget. Uh, by the way, there's a terrific article in today's Washington Post by Robert Samuelson about precisely some of the issues that make our uh, defense spending seem larger than it really is in effect uh, and, and one of the reasons why we can in good conscience say we actually need to spend more. So I, you know, and I would add to that it's also clear that this is a problem that requires both, you know, uh, revenue and uh, expenditure adjustments. It, it's not something that can be solved, uh, you know, one way or, or the other. You're going to have to have both elements of this uh, involved in a solution that enables you to spend what we need. But in the end of the day, the reason, you know, a lot of my, co even some of my colleagues uh, in the think tank world say, you know, 4 percent of GDP, that's just arbitrary. You know, it, it doesn't really tell you anything because what really matters is what you're buying. And of course, that's true. But what the 4% what the number means, and the reason we use, by the way, the 2% threshold with our allies, is it's, it's a surrogate for how much are we willing to tax ourselves as a society in order to defend ourselves. That's really what it's about. And so, I mean, I think this is all manageable, uh, but it requires political leadership, uh, and it requires our 
you know, our Congress to, uh, and the President and the OMB to step up and do the right thing. And, and I would say that that's another reason why it's important to open up the discussion on what some of these challenges are um, so that, th that uh, the American people can better understand what it is that we're up against and what it could mean for the country in the, in the long term. Um, and I would also say that even though we can look at the entitlements and how it pressurizes the defense budget, one of the things that we can't forget is that entitlements are pressurizing the defense budget from within. When you look at uh, how the defense budget is constructed and the cost of personnel and health care and what have you, um, that's a pressure on the budget. And I think that a more sophisticated assessment, discussion, and debate um, on what exactly are we buying. You know, we, we talk a lot about top line, but it's important to talk about how much of that is, is part of the, what I would call the investment account. And, and we have to have, in, in, in my view, a much more sophisticated discussion about the, the fiscal health of the country and what it costs to properly defend uh, our interests uh, globally. Very quickly, just a few statistics to reinforce both the question and the responses. The, uh, the Commission's report citing CBO, 2018 CBO data said that net interest payments on the debt are expected to surpass what we spend on defense in fiscal year 2023. Mm -hmm. So our nation will be spending more on interest on the debt than we do on defending ourselves in 2023. So there clearly is a problem. And then secondly, roughly speaking, we spend about 3.3% of our GDP on defense, rough, roughly speaking, as you said, and about 15.6% of, of the federal budget. Both of those statistics are at or near historical post-World War II lows. Next question. Uh, back in the back. Hi, Rebecca Keel from The Hill. So in addition to what the military has to do to carry out the NDS, it's now also been deployed to the southern border, and there's the possibility of Trump declaring a national emergency to use some Pentagon funding. What are your thoughts on whether the military can afford this and how it might affect its ability to carry out the NDS? Well, I share the view of uh, uh, the outgoing chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Mac Thornberry, now ranking member, that it would be inappropriate to, um, to uh, declare a national emergency and use the defense budget as the piggy bank in which to, uh, to fix this immigration dispute between the President and the Congress. Um, okay. Next question. Yes, right here. Hi, thank you for a very interesting discussion. Valeria Egis, one voice of America Russian Service. I was wondering whether you could expand a little bit your recommendations for the national uh, defense strategy in relation to Russia. And also, you already touched on the INF Treaty, but I still was wondering to get your views on do you think the, if the United States withdraws from the INF Treaty, can it impact the new start and can we expect our new arm races? Thank you. Um. Well, in the report, we uh, make some recommendations about how to uh, make the uh, so-called contact and blunt layers of the uh, force um, uh, more capable of actually deterring any kind of Russian uh, adventurism um, along the um, border between Russia and the frontline states of NATO. Uh, and that includes more long-range fires and a variety of other steps that are that are are here. The, the point, though, I would I want to want to stress: all of this uh, is essentially meant to um, strengthen our ability to deter conflict, because that's really the nation's objective. You know, our objective is not to get into a war with China 30 years from now or 20 years from now, or to have to fight with Russia. The the point is to make it so unappetizing for either China or Russia. To, to take steps that would you know, be inimical to the U.S. interest that they don't even think about doing it. On, on INF and START, again, that was really outside the uh, scope of, of what we were uh, doing as a commission. Uh, I, you know, it, it's possible that a U.S. withdrawal from INF might have some uh, repercussions. I mean, the, the Russians have certainly suggested that it might have some repercussions on their willingness to extend New START when it comes up for renewal in 2021. Um, my own view on that is that, in, um, number one, um, the, 
you know, Russians themselves uh, came to us uh, in the Bush administration and made clear their own unhappiness with the limitations of the INF Treaty. The INF Treaty bans two countries uh, from having um, missiles in the 500 to 5,500 kilometer range. Everybody else is free to, you know, uh, build as many as they would like. Uh, and we've witnessed a very large Chinese buildup opposite Taiwan of missiles precisely in that range. Uh, uh, we've watched um, uh, other countries develop uh, missiles that range. Brad mentioned uh, Iran. Um, uh, Russia is not, um, uh, you know, uh, unaware of this or immune of it. And those missiles are closer to them than they are to us. Um, but for their own reasons, they you know, preferred that we would be the ones to leave the treaty rather than they be the ones to leave the treaty. Um, that being said, it's hard for me to understand how anyone can make an argument that a treaty that bans two countries from uh, a certain ca uh, category of weapons, which only one country is abiding by, should continue to be the policy of the sole remaining party to the treaty. It, it just doesn't make much sense. On New START, my own personal view is I hope that we renew New START, despite the fact that I testified against it uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee when the treaty was up for ratification. And I say that because right now uh, Russia has a, a new uh, road mobile ICBM in production. They have a new heavy ICBM in production. They uh, are experimenting with a new rail mobile ICBM, although they haven't made a decision about whether they're going to deploy it or not. Um, and uh, right now, we still are in the you know, view graph stage of developing our own modernized um, ICBM. So I think it's actually disadvantageous to us at this point in time to get out of the treaty um, unless we make a much more significant investment in strategic modernization than even we're recommending. Admiral, if you want to say that. No, I'd, I'd rather take some more questions, okay. actually. Just a quick interjection. <laughs> Russia has been in violation of the INF Treaty at least since 2014. And, of course, they're trying to pretend that the U.S. is starting an arms race. They've already started the arms race, I would argue. It's a matter of whether we're going to respond or not and how we're going to respond. Right. Next agree. question. Right here. Uh, Lauren Meyer with Washington Times. Uh, <laughs> until someone else is confirmed or if uh, he is confirmed, do you have any hesitation for Acting Secretary uh, Patrick Shanahan uh, as a leader of the Defense Department without prior military experience to implement the NDS and consider your conclusions? I don't have any reservations. In fact, the engagements that we've had, I've found him to be extremely involved, uh, quick study on, on the issues. Um, and. And I would say that particularly as we look towards some of the new technology, the, the increased focus that the department has, has uh, the sense that I think that there is more um, rigor and structure behind moving some of those technologies ahead more quickly, um, I think is largely driven uh, by him. Um, and, you know, I also think that the the, the, the 10 technologies that have um, uh, been highlighted by the department are spot on. Um, I would also uh, endorse Mike Griffin, who is also, um, you know, probably as good as you're going to get in that space. Uh, I think that, that, you know, it's a pretty good combination from my standpoint. Um, the focus on space that the, the administration has put forth and that I think recently uh, Acting Secretary Shanahan designated Mike Griffin to stand up the Space De Developmental Agency or, or whatever the acronym stands for um, is appropriate. I think that we had taken our eye off of space. We have assumed that it's always going to be there. Um, it is that, That's a bad assumption. And so I would say from what I have seen from the focus that's being applied on particularly looking to the future and running a more efficient department, um, I'm very comfortable with that. And I apologize for going on so long, but. Uh, I, I, would just, I would just add one thing. I, I do hope that the president nominates, uh, you know, a, a full-time secretary of defense because 
the problem of vacancies in the Department of Defense, to go back to the point that uh, Admiral Ruffhead discussed earlier that we address in the report of the imbalance in uh, civil military uh, debate and discussion inside the Pentagon has been exacerbated for a long time by the persistent uh, problem of vacancies on the civilian side. Uh, as Admiral Ruffhead likes to point out, going back to Goldwater Nichols, we started to, to construct very large, very capable uh, military staffs that are permanently in place, uh, while the civilian side has been subjected to an awful, an awful amount of, at the presidential appointee level, uh, churn um, because of difficulties of confirmation and, and vetting and whatnot. And, and we just have to get to the point where we can fill all those positions. I know when I was under Secretary of Defense, we chronically had about a 25 percent vacancy rate, and that's just not acceptable. And I think this also comes back around and plays into something that's been brought up. You know, we touched on nuclear and uh, INF and the New START and what have you. You know, the 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 lack of the civilian um, uh, voice, the gaps that exist. You know, if you're a young uh, professional policy person that you know really uh, is engaged by things like uh, nuclear strategy or you know the role of technology and how does technology get applied when you don't have a stable f uh, predictable future you're not going to draw the best and brightest in to work on some of these hard problems and these are not easy problems and so in a way you know it all kind of knits together and that's why I think when, when we looked at the security strategy, the defense strategy, you know, you really need to begin to think about how does all this stuff work? What are the concepts? And you have to be able to have the right type of people working these issues. And, and, and I think this is an area that needs work so that we can draw the best and brightest, not just for the problems that we face today, but you know who will be the future leaders of the department 15, 20, 25 years from now? And, and a lot of them are the young folks that are sitting in this audience right here. But they have to believe that they're going to make a difference. Thank you. Next question. Right here, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Evan Carlick, U.S. Navy, though here in my own personal capacity. Thank you, Ambassador and Admiral, for your remarks. I have a short question and a longer question. Um, the first is that while Funding from Congress is important. It's also important to think about how the department can operate more efficiently. And I noticed the report didn't mention base realignment and closure. So do you feel like BRAC has a, has a part to play uh, as we move forward to, to do things better? I know it's a, a scary topic for Congress as a whole. Uh, the longer question, your report talks about the need for innovative operational concepts, but it does criticize dynamic force employment, which is one of Secretary Mattis's new operational concepts he was trying to introduce. Um, I don't quite follow what the report, uh, how it described it. It said DFE appears to refer to creating efficiencies within the force and decreasing the need to expand force structure by having a single asset perform multiple missions in different theaters on a near simultaneous basis. The way I interpreted it, it was more driven in terms of operational unpredictability and having forces move away from their well-worn deployment cycles. I think the best case study for the Navy was the Truman Strike Group, what it did last year, going to the Med, launching aircraft from the Adriatic to the Baltic, going back to the States for a month, and then going up to the Arctic Circle, which threw the Russians off. Um, so what exactly do you find lacking in dynamic force employment, and wh why don't you think it's an appropriate concept? Okay. Thank you. Um, since it's a Navy guy and a Navy <laughs> question, I'll take it. How's that? There you go. Um, I'll do BRAC if you want. I was going to do BRAC, too. Yeah, okay, but, you got it. Um, BRAC is, BRAC is absolutely required, I think. Um, and I know it's politically hard, but there's a lot of infrastructure that's not used. I would also submit that there's a lot of redundant infrastructure. Um, but it is important that we think about BRAC also in creating some of these new uh, training venues that we have. So, you, you know, we have to also look at more than a base. We have to look at airspace, sea space, and, and and so I think it's important, again, to strategically look at what it is we're trying to do, but, but we're carrying too much uh, brick and mortar. Um, with regard to dynamic force employment um, and the example that you cited, it's an example. 
and the point that we were driving at when we uh, probed into dynamic force employment, when we were interested on, okay, what are the impacts on readiness? How does that potentially affect maintenance? What does that do to the logistics infrastructure that you're going to need to more flexibly do this as a matter of routine and not a one-off? Um, the, the second and third order questions uh, just didn't seem to be very, the responses didn't seem to be very fulfilling. Uh, it's all well and good to have that anecdote, but uh, how many anecdotes can you string together and what's the effect on the force? What other infrastructure do you need? What are the costs of doing it? So we, we were not very satisfied with the answers that we got there. But, and so I, just on the general question of uh, department efficiency, I mean, we, we do address that in the report, um, and it's obviously very important. If you're going to ask the taxpayers to, um, you know, to sit still while the Congress appropriates additional dollars for defense, they have to have some level of confidence that it's being spent uh, appropriately and wisely. And so we endorse a number of uh, reform efforts that have been underway for some time to um, make sure that the department is auditable and that we can, you know, uh, account uh, for the money. The, the problem is that all too frequently people think, well, whatever the problem is, you know, we can just wring it out of waste, fraud, and abuse in the Pentagon, and, and that'll make up for the bogey that we're in. And, the, and, and the, the, that's just not the case. I mean, even the most optimistic um, assessments that we heard of what might be gained from reform and efficiency in the department is about $150 billion over 10 years. It's not even close to filling the gap uh, that, you know, we're talking about over the next um, FIDIP and, and, and beyond that next decade, really. So I think that's important. I, on BRAC, I would just say, you know, I, obviously we need to rationalize how the department, uh, you know, uses its facilities and there's unused capacity. Everybody who works in the department knows that. Um, I think the Congress has got some concerns about it because we, we labor under the fact that the BRAC that was, I think, in 2004, I think it was 2004 or 5, we promised the Congress efficiencies uh, that really didn't come about as a result of the BRAC. And so there is some suspicion on the Hill that, um, you know, we, we uh, you know, are not really going to realize the efficiencies and that we may be taking down... Um, capacity that we may need later, for instance, if we increase end strength in the services, et cetera. So the Congress, uh, you know, has their point of view. I understand it. I still think I agree with Gary. We probably do need a BRAC, and we, and, and we need to certainly let the department show the Congress that it needs a BRAC, which was for a while something the Congress would not let the department do. Yeah. And it's also possible if you do it strategically and look at what the requirements are going to be going into the future you may actually end up wanting to go out and acquire more uh, areas to do some of the things that I mentioned, for example, training, um, and, and create environments that are conducive to the type of, of uh, combat environments we're going to see in the, in the future. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, uh, thanks to those who joined us here today, and thanks to those who have tuned in online or via C-SPAN. A special thanks to Ambassador Edelman and Admiral Ruffhead for being here. Join me in a round of applause for them, please. Thanks.